And we are live. All right. Can we, have, we have someone to be willing to give us prayer and then scripture. I have the scripture. Okay. Oh, well, you can go ahead. We'll go to scripture first and then the prayer. Okay. The earth is the Lord's. This is Psalms 24 NIV. The earth is the Lord's and the everything in it, the world and all who live in it. For he founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. Who may ascend the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to an idol or swear by what is false, he will receive blessings from the Lord and vindication from God, his Savior. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, O God of Jacob, Selah. I've read Psalms 24, verse 1 through 6. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading and hearing of his word. Amen. I'll pray. All right. Our Father in heaven, we thank you this evening that we can come back to our Bible study. We thank you for the book of Romans and how it tends to challenge us. And we look forward to this study and the explanation of some of the points. We thank you for all of those who are here. We are really grateful to see Pauline in tow. And we ask that you would just be with her and keep her safe as well as the rest of us. We thank you for our pastor and how he takes so much time with us and the provisions that Gethsemane has made to get us our shots and our boosters and whatever we need. We thank you for people like Pat Watkins, who is so faithful in making sure we know what's going on. Lord, we ask that you would open our hearts and minds tonight. And we look forward to our revival. And we ask that we would just not look on revival as a word, but we we ask that you would help us to be revived in Jesus' name and for his sake we pray. Amen. 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 We thank God for the prayer. We thank God for the scripture. And now we're going to um, listen to the first portion of um, the first chapter in the book of Romans. The Book of Romans. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God, the gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures regarding his son, who as to his earthly life was a descendant of David, and who through the spirit of holiness was appointed the Son of God in power by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Through him we receive grace and apostleship to call all the Gentiles to faith and obedience for his name's sake. And you also are among those Gentiles who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. To all in Rome who are loved by God and called to be his holy people, Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you, because your faith is being reported all over the world. God, whom I serve in my spirit in preaching the gospel of his Son, is my witness how constantly I remember you in my prayers at all times. And I pray that now at last by God's will, the way may be open for me to come to you. I long to see you so that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to make you strong. That is, that you and I may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. 
I do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, that I plan many times to come to you, but have been prevented from doing so until now, in order that I might have a harvest among you, just as I have had among the other Gentiles. I am obligated both to Greeks and non-Greeks, both to the wise and the foolish. That is why I am so eager to preach the gospel also to you who are in Rome. Okay. That is the first portion of the 15 verses that we're going to discuss tonight. And we'd like to welcome back our Facebook um, family that's in our Facebook students that are here. As I was sharing prior to us going live, our plan for this week is the first 15 verses of chapter one, according to our book, um, the biblical, the basic Bible commentaries, the book of Romans. And then next week, we will pick up with 16 to the end of the chapter. On the 20th, we will be in the midst of our revival. Our revival will be the 18th, 19th, and 20th. And then when we come back the following Wednesday, which would be the 27th, we will then uh, continue verse 2. And at that point, we should be uh, moving smoothly from um, that point going forward. So I just wanted to share uh, with you, the Facebook family, uh, where we are. Again, next week will be continuation of chapter one. And then the final week, uh, the following week will be revival. So we are looking forward uh, to those occurring and to those uh, happening. So now we want to prepare our hearts and minds for our lesson for today as we are going into again the book of Romans okay I gotta find it I can get a little Uh, oh no, why is not slideshow? Okay, let me seek something right quick. All right, All right. Let's share. Yeah. All right, here we go. All right. So start off by sort of giving you an understanding, as I always say, one of the most important things when you are studying the word of God is to always have an understanding of the content, the context, what's what's happening, because um, the words are not written just to be written, but there are always um, circumstances and situations around what's going on that lends uh, its, uh, the understanding of why things were written, what was going on. And so we want to begin um, with the book of, of Romans chapter one. And we want to say that the book of Romans is the only Pauline epistle well, the only letter written by Paul or attributed to Paul to address a church that Paul did not start. Every other letter, the uh, Thessalonians, uh, the um, Philippians, the Corinthians, and all the other letters that Paul writes to churches, Romans is the only letter that was written to a church he did not start. Therefore, in the beginning, Paul is identifying himself and introducing himself to these churches that had been started by others. Um, Paul needs to explain also why he's writing them. And one of the things that we will discover, you will discover in the word of God, that whenever Paul is writing a letter to the church, Paul is not writing the letter just to say, hey, how y'all doing? Everything is good. 
there are always issues. There are always problems. There are always conflicts that Paul is addressing for the writing of the letters. So just as it is in our current churches, our local churches, we always have issues. We always have problems. Why? Because churches are made of people. People bring issues. People bring problems. So nothing is new up under the sun, but no one ought to get rattled or come unglued because issues occur in church. They're going to occur in church. There is no perfect church because the minute I showed up, that takes perfection out. The minute you show up, that disqualifies perfection. So Paul is writing because there are some issues going on. So whenever there is a letter to churches in the Bible, in the New Testament, the Pauling letters, please understand that the, the reason why letters are being written is because there is an issue going on in which uh, the writer, or in this instance, Paul, is seeking to address. Well, what's the situation? What's going on? Paul has yet to visit Rome, but he's aware of the current conditions in Rome uh, among the house churches. So in other words, uh, Paul understands the Roman house churches. He understands that there are some issues going on. More than likely, he heard it through the gospel grapevine. And we know that, you know, you always hear about issues in other people's churches <laughs> because somebody's going to tell what's going on in their church. Uh, Paul's partners in ministry, Priscilla and Aquila. And may I mention that Paul deliberately lists Priscilla first. This is major because she's the sister. And she's listed before her husband, which is not the norm of that particular time and day. Husbands were mentioned first. And a lot of instances, the wives were never mentioned at all. But in this instance, Paul deliberately mentions Priscilla first before her husband. Paul has been kept in the loop about the situation in Rome. Christian missionaries have reached Rome and set up several Greek speaking Jewish synagogues. And if you remember in the book of Acts, uh, the whole issue, the whole reason for deacons coming on board was because there was some issues going on between the Greek speaking uh, Christians and the Hebrew speaking Christians and because of that, the disciples discovered, the apostles discovered, hey, we can't handle all this. We're going to need some help. And this is how the office of the deacon came along, a server, because there was a conflict going between the Greek speaking, uh, the Greek speaking widows and the Hebrew speaking widows. And there was some language barriers and some conflict going on. So we still seeing now some of the manifestation of that particular situation that occurred that comes along. And so now you have the uh, Greek speaking uh, Jews, uh, Greek speaking Gentiles, I'm sorry, and who has Jewish synagogues and then the others. The synagogues attracted people who were immigrated to Rome from a particular part of the Roman Empire. Conflicts occurs between the Christian missionaries and the zealous Jewish opponents. Without a centralized organization, the Roman government closed all the synagogues and expelled the agitators. Now, this is some things that happened prior to um, the, the, this actual book being written from Paul. So Paul is aware of the history of what has occurred in the Jew in Rome with the Christians that are there. The edict of uh, Claudius, Claudius is what probably led Priscilla and Aquila to flee Rome, which led to them meeting Paul in Corinth. Paul was aware of them, but Paul was aware of them before they returned to Rome. There were probably about five house churches with new leaders, because as people fled, because churches were expelled, made illegal, um, the spirit didn't die. There were individuals that were there who didn't leave. And so new leaders came aboard 
These charismatic leaders came to the front and many were led, many were well-to-do, pardons and partnerses who had the means to provide a location. In other words, they were house churches and they had the house where the churches met and where people gathered together. And so, you know, unlike many of us believe or are led to believe that, you know, well-to-do Christians didn't exist, there were always well-to-do Christians who lend and, and had substance and was able to lend their homes because, of course, in the beginning, there were church houses. Literally, there were houses that turned into churches. And so people would gather in these environments. And so if you were well-to-do, you had a larger family and then you had room for others to gather in support. But unfortunately, one of the things that happens then, which happens now, there are often people who begin to have a feeling of superiority. And that's one of the dangers. And so there was a feeling of superiority among the Gentile Christians over the Jewish Christians, and it bubbled up. Nowadays, it can be among denominations where certain denominations feel that they are superior to other denominations. And this causes conflict in our current local churches. Conflicts over leadership began to surface when the Gentile Christian leaders resisted the resumption of leadership by Jewish Christian missionaries. Uh, yes, yes. And, and, and in an instance which was put in the chat that that could sort of seem like where we are thanks to the pandemic, uh, many of us um, are in a form of home church. Um, uh, where uh, the only difference is, is that while you're at home now, because of technology and the hybrid approach, you're able to, as you, many of you were at home on Sunday, but you was able to tune in and link up with us of those of us that was in the building because of technology, but consider no Zoom, no internet, and, you know, you just had all those various churches. So that's the way it, it was. And so each church sometimes became its own island, if you will. And that caused, you know, and then you had some churches that was established. The leaders left because of government issues. They came back and they wanted to resume the positions and the titles they had. And then people that was there like, no, nah, you know, that ain't about to happen now. Our author labels these individuals uh, the conservative Christians versus the liberal Christians, charismatic versus traditional, Jewish versus Gentiles, ethics, different church calendars, and the plethora of other issues was causing this schism or this uh, gulf between these two individuals. Now, the strong were the Gentile Christians and the weak were the Jewish Christians. Now in the book, he says the strong Gentiles were considered the liberal um, individuals and then the weak or the Jewish Christians were considered the conservatives, um, but, uh, but they had a different perspective based upon the experience. And if you remember, I've always talked about when it comes to theology, theology is understanding of the study of God but theology is the study of God from humanity's perspective. It is not the study of God from God's perspective. And so included is reason, it is scripture, it is experience, and it is, is based upon your experience. And there's four, there's collateral. So we have reason, we have tradition, we have scripture, and we have tradition. I mean, and we have experience. And so our experience has to be brought to the table. And I think one of the problems that was emerging then that often emerges now is that we have some individuals who want to speak for every Christian based solely on their experience. God is larger than you. God is larger than me. God has touched various folks. And I believe that each person has a testimony of what God did for them. And I think their testimony is just as valid as my testimony. But the problem is we have a group of people 
who deem themselves as the authority on theology, the authority on the word of God, the authority on anything. And so unless your perspective comes from them, then there's no credibility. And that was one of the problems we had as African-Americans trying to create a theology and understanding of God from our experience. And so others did not deem our theology relevant because they could not understand it. Well, it was not their experience. If I'm one who have been favored and privileged because of the color of my skin, I see things differently than the one who has been at the disadvantage because I've been at the advantage. If I'm one who have been privileged, then my perspective is different than the one who has been underprivileged because of the color of their skin or their ethnic background. So one of the tragedies is to try to force everyone to have the same experience when you haven't had the same experience. Our experience as a people is based upon our experience. Our theology is based upon our experience. Richard Allen was not welcome in St. George any longer because they decided to walk and stop and stand in the sanctuary when the prayer was going forth. For those who threw them out, that wasn't it. They don't know what it meant to be considered an outsider, to be segregated against in the church because Richard Allen, Epsilon Jones, and the others were to sit in the peanut gallery. They were made, they had assigned seating in that church. And if your skin looked like ours, they had to sit in the balcony. So here we are in God's church and it's segregated based upon the color of your skin where you can sit, where you can worship. Now, for those who was in charge, their experience was totally different than Richard Allen's experience. And that's why they said that's enough. They physically threw them out of the church because they stopped to reverence the prayer. And that's how the AME church got started. It was nothing spiritual about it. It was the hypocrisy of a church claiming to love God, but have relegated a certain group of people to a seated area based upon the color of their skin. So I won't get into that, but that just gives you an example of how this division wasn't new. This was something that Paul was addressing way back when. Obviously, somebody didn't get the memo. The author uses the term conservative and liberal, but I don't want us to confuse these Christians with our current political groups of who we call conservative and who we call liberal. They were not dealing with the same ideology as our current groups back in this time. He uses these terms in the book, but I don't want you to automatically connect, <laughs> you know, the liberals and the conservatives with what we connect today as the liberals and the conservatives. There is, later, there is later proof that they were both groups in both groups. So in each group, you had conservative thinking people, you had liberal thinking people according to that day and in each group. So each group had, so even though he called them liberal, there were conservative minded people in that liberal group. And even though he called the other group conservative, there were liberal-minded people in that group. Now, he addressed the Romans, the address of the Romans. The church conflicts help to explain the level of tact and craftiness that Paul uses to address the house churches in Rome. He addresses them as Christians in Rome. He gives a blanket identification marker, he identified them all as Christians. He's aware that there are certain individuals who identify with certain people and certain things, but he's not going to get caught up in that minutia. He's going to move beyond that to, for them to understand the importance of unity. And here we are, 2022, and the church is probably more divided now than it has ever been. And a great portion of this divide was amplified in 2016 with the election of the former president, 45, 
we see a, a widening among those who call themselves Christians and their propensity and their love for an agenda of hatred. And we know that God is a God of love. The strong identified themselves with Jesus Christ, stressing their election, and the weak identified themselves as the ones called to be saints. So we have some folks, you know, identify themselves as the elect of Christ, and then you got other folks saying, hey, we're saints of God, stressing a high priority on moral standards of the Old Testament. And that's why they would be considered the conservatives, because they stress the high moral, and in some regards, none of that have changed. You know, conservatives today, the political conservatives consider themselves high on pro placing a high priority on morals. But I don't really see it. They they say that, but I don't see it. Because they overwhelmingly backed a man who had four baby mamas, three or four marriages, and didn't even know the difference between 1st and 2nd Corinthians or 2 Corinthians. But they champion a person with little to no morality, and they're supposed to be the moral compass. Paul seeks to find a unification location for all of God's children in Rome. His effort to find an inclusive basis for the church to convey a motivation for moral accept for mutual acceptance. Paul is seeking to find a common ground that will unite the Christians in Rome. He's trying to figure out, okay, we, we got the differences. We got that, we got that worked out. We got that going well. What commonalities do we have? Where can we come and reason together? Let me stop here. Are there any questions or any comments that you all may have inside the Zoom? Or are there any questions inside of our uh, Facebook family, Sister Johnson? Are there any questions? There are no questions on Facebook yet. Okay. Any questions inside? Anyone have any questions on what we've talked about so far? Okay, if not, we'll keep moving. This effort at unification is one of the keys to understanding the first 15 verses of this chapter and actually the entire letter because it is so important that Paul is trying to bring unity. And see, again, you may not catch this on the surface of just reading, and that's why I say it's so important to understand the context of the text because you could read it and get a whole different interpretation if you do not know what was going on. I say it all the time and I continue to say it. When we read the Bible, it is like we are um, overhearing a conversation that didn't include us. The young folks call it ear hustling now. You know, we eavesdrop it because this book was written to the church in Rome. We're not in Rome. So it was not written to us, but it is written for us. There are some tangible things that we could take from it, but in order to get a clear understanding, we have to know what were the dynamics of the time that the chapter was of the book was written and what was the world like when it was written. Because when you understand the world of the, the text, when you understand the world of the chapters of the books of the Bible, then it gives you a better understanding of what was actually going on during this time. Paul begins to state the goal or his purpose. It is a missionary letter that sets forth the gospel that Paul wants to preach, but also aims at finding commonality. Why? Because the infighting had become toxic and it became a distraction to the work of the church. Isn't it funny that Satan still uses infighting to become toxic and becomes a distraction to the work of the church? So we are so caught up fighting each other because this person baptizes in this name and this person say you ought to speak in tongues. All of these things become 
toxic and distracting to the purpose of the church, which is to save and affect the entire world. If our churches were more in tune to pushing and promoting the love of Jesus, then I think America would be in a better condition that, than she currently is. The author is conscious of the term slave. So he tries to soften it up because he's considering how the term has been demonized and doesn't want anyone reading it now to be turned off. And I appreciate his attempt to be uh, sensitive, but first of all, you've been a part of this church for a while. You already know that the biblical slavery in the American chattel slavery experience were night and day. If you recall, Solomon's slaves dressed in gold. They wasn't made to wear uh, uh, potato sacks. <laughs> Or no clothes at all. No, no, no. They dressed in gold. So it was a whole different, whole different slave system that was in place. Uh, again, I'll just share a little bit more about the difference. The eye for an eye and two for a tooth, which a lot of people use for the death penalty, comes directly from God's punishment for those who mistreated and abused those serving as slaves. So there was no chopping off the foot of Kuta Kente and you saliva, you know, and, and being around. There was no lynching uh, uh, Nat Turner and setting his body on fire and cutting off his body parts and keeping him as trophy. That wasn't happening in the biblical days because there was an ethic, there was a code of conduct that was given to those who were slaves because in those days, Biblical slaves often did well in life. Your status depended upon who you sold yourself into slavery to. Because instead of filing bankruptcy, when people did not have the money to pay their debts, they often became slaves to serve off their debts. And they were considered indentured servants. And generally, they sold, were sold into slavery, sold themselves into slavery, for seven years. And when the year of Jubilee came, all debts were clear. So if I happen to sold myself into slavery because I owe GM a couple thousand dollars because I got their car and I wasn't able to pay their car off. And so I've set up a system now where I'm paying them. And next year happens to be the year of Jubilee. I've paid one year of payments. And so now I'm debt free. That's what the year of Jubilee was about. Now, we have tried to spiritualize it and make it something to be joyous about. Now, I will say this. Hey, if I'm in debt and my debt is clear, there will be some happiness and there will be some joy in my soul. But that is not what the year of Jubilee is all about. And I hear people misuse it, misquote it, take it out of context. Yeah, we're declaring a year of Jubilee. We're going to praise God. We're going to shout and dance. That was not what Jubilee was all about. The year of Jubilee was a clearance of all debt. Remember, the widow whose husband had died and told Elijah, hey, my husband was one of your preachers, one of your students, and he died, and now we in debt. And they are threatening to take my sons and make them slaves to pay off the debt that my husband left. And that's who Elijah said, tell you what, what you got in the house? He said, I ain't got nothing but these empty jars. Take them jars and find every jar you can take and borrow from your neighbors and start pulling the oil. The issue was because of debt from her husband, her sons were going to have to take up the debt. So that's how slavery looked in the biblical days. It was not the emasculating. It was not the, uh, 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 the, the, the brutalness that was experienced in America and the Americas. So his attempt to soften up the word slave was because in his 
presentation, he did not want individuals to feel isolated or turned off because of the term slave. And so some Bibles write the word servant. But again, to be a slave in the biblical days, you had more protection than we ever experienced. Our foreparents ever experienced slavery in America. As a matter of fact, even among Africans, they had slaves. But the slave code in Africa allowed slaves to marry the slaveholders or their children. Marry. <laughs> and after a year of proving yourself, when it came time for war, you were given weapons to help that particular tribe fight against other tribes. Now we know it took hell and high water for us to get a chance to fight in the Civil War. So total different, total different systems. But again, he was attempting to try to soften up the words. And, you know, we appreciate his efforts. Um, but again, uh, it wasn't uncommon for slaves or captives to work in high positions in administrations that they were brought captive to. And oftentimes their loyalty would be a key for them finding freedom or to elevate their status. Remember, we did a sermon series on the book of Daniel in March and the beginning of March. And we know that Daniel and the three Hebrew boys uh, who was names was changed to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, we know that these four boys were a part of an elite group that was captured from their homeland and brought us captives or slaves to Babylon. But Nebuchadnezzar had enough sense to use them to help him. Sounds familiar? <laughs> Some of our biggest, brightest, and strongest was brought here to help them gain wealth. And so now our president is saying, He's not comfortable with reparations unless it includes Native Americans. Now, they do deserve something. I, I'll agree with that. But the sole purpose of us coming here was to make wealth for somebody else. So that troubles me because our foreparents were owed this. And especially when we consider that the slave owners after the Civil War and after slavery was abolished, they got reparations. So how are you gonna get reparations to the people who enslaved humans and not get reparations to the descendants of the humans who were enslaved? Some groups felt privileged and above the law, which sounds familiar. There's nothing new up under the sun. And Paul was trying to address this problem in the Roman house churches. He's trying to strategically be led and sensitive to the movement in the direction of the Holy Spirit so that he could address this problem. So the beginning of these verses, verses 1 through 15, Paul appeals to emphasize holiness being connected to the spirit with ethical responsibility. However, the problem is when one has experienced a new birth, ethical responsibility is present. But the problem is, is that whenever we hear people talk about morality, these days, it is only connected to sexual sins. Why is that major Duckworth? Glad you asked. Because it will allow certain pastors to never address racism as a sin. And so certain churches promote and perpetuate it because you do understand that American Christianity is in bed with white supremacy. Keeping the status quo, which means someone has to be beneath them, where we know that authentic, true Christianity, we are all brothers and sisters in Christ. And so instead of making room at the table, when you find yourself trying to exclude people from the table, that is not God. And this is what Paul was trying to explain to them. 
And that's one of the major problems with America right now is that we have limited morality to just sexual sins. We want to talk about money. We want to talk about the fact that Exxon Mobil made $11 billion last quarter and we're still paying out the wazoo for gas prices. Greed. That has always been the problem. One of the major problems. That's what led to slavery. Greed. The term church is rarely used, but remember that Christians and church weren't seen as badges of honor then as they are now. As a matter of fact, people who follow Jesus, they were not even called Christians until a later chapter, the middle chapter, I think the 11th chapter of Acts. Prior to that, these individuals who follow Jesus were called the people of the way. And to be called a Christian was seen as a derogatory term. And it wasn't until the church in Antioch took on the, the mantle of being called a Christian because it identified them with following Christ. And that's when it began to take the turn from being seen as derogatory as being seen as a badge of honor. So it's possible that during these times, each congregation may have called themselves something different than a church. May have called themselves something different than a church. But it, the main thing is that they was promoting and pushing the love of Christ. That's what makes them a church. It's not who you call yourself, but it's how you act. It's how you behave. It's how you love. That's how you are known if you're a disciple by the love that you have for your brothers and sisters. The only way. Then there's the announcement of the mission. There is a major stress, listen to this, on inclusiveness. Again, if you are a child of God, if you are a Christian, if you are a church following Jesus, there has to be a sense of including everyone. No one is left from the table. No one is excluded. That's not how God works. And so Paul refers to all of you in his prayer in verse eight. He's trying to be in unity. You don't bring unity by trying to separate folks based off of what you think. God loves everyone and God has created everyone. Everyone was created in the image of God. So what makes you think you can disclude or this, this, uh, you can exclude or leave somebody out? Paul assures them that the relationship that he's trying to develop with them will be mutual, that he will learn and share with them and they will learn and share with him. He's an apostle. But he's understanding that he doesn't have to come in saying I'm big, bad, whatever. I'm bringing something your way and I want to learn from you as well as teach you. And you can learn from me as well as teach me. Then Paul shares the struggles that have kept him from making his Roman visit over the last few years. In Acts 21 and 3 and 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, we see some of the issues. Trouble collecting the Jerusalem offering, which set him back a year. Matter of fact, uh, if we could have someone to find those particular scriptures, Acts 20 verses 1 through 3 in 2 Corinthians, not 2 Corinthians, but 2 Corinthians <laughs> verses 8 and 9. We can have someone to read those scriptures, please. You can unmute and share the scripture. I have Acts 21 through 3. Okay. When the, when the uproar had ended, Paul sent for the disciples and after encouraging them, said goodbye and set out for Macedonia. He traveled through that area, speaking many words of encouragement to the people and finally arrived in Greece where he stayed three months because the Jews made a plot against him 
just as he was about to sail for Syria, he decided to go back through Macedonia. Okay, and that will speak to the later portion, uh, bullet point number three in this particular, what you call that, speak to that. Now, could we have someone read 2 Corinthians 8 and 9? What chapter? 2 Corinthians, oh. Oh, you know what? Don't worry about that because these are these are chapters. I'm sorry, chapters eight and nine. I'm taking this from the book, so it's not a chapter. These are in themselves chapters, but you will you will discover that there is the offering issue, which set him back a year. Then he's in deal with several imprisonments, and then what um, Deacon Bates just read. You have the hostility of the Jewish zealots against Paul because you you recall now for most of Paul's ministry, he had to fight the authentic, authentic call of his apostleship. His ministry was always in conflict and there were people always doubting if he was real because he was not among the disciples who walked with Jesus during his public ministry. Those three and a half years, Paul was not there. But Paul did have a one-on-one -on -one with Christ. Remember, he had the domestic role Ex Damascus Road experience, and then he spent time with Jesus, and Jesus taught him and brought him up to speed with everything that was taught to the disciples, Peter and the boys. But because of that, Paul was not always seen as an authentic apostle. And so Paul is always fighting in his writings and make it setting the record straight because there were always folks hostile towards him. And it is believed that it may have been many of them that led to some of his imprisonments. Again, sounds familiar. You Amen. start, you start fighting for justice. You start standing for what's right. And you're going to make some folks who should be right on the right mad. <laughs> and they're going to try to find a way to silence you or make sure you end up in prison. There's a major stress. Oh, I went the wrong way. What did I? Uh, okay. Oh, in verses 14 and 15, Paul is trying to be inclusive among all walks of life. Uh, this chapter, chapter one, verses 14 and 15. And someone can read that. You want that read? Yes, ma'am. Uh, verse 14, I am under no obligation both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. So I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. Okay. And again, we, we, you know, which, which he mentions that, you know, Bob, Bob, his choice of words, barbarian, could have definitely been seen as a, uh, you know, something that necessarily wouldn't have been cool. Uh, <laughs> uh, but it basically, uh, I'm reading out the book now, which says in, in, in 14, Paul describes his sense of obligation in language that may seem somewhat repulsive in the Greek. Greco-Roman world, the term barbarian or non-Greek indicated someone who could not speak Latin or Greek. The negative connotation was related both to language ability and cultural awkwardness. The term barbarian would have included many Jews as well as the great bulk of the population in Spain. So again, this is just some of the, 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 the common things, but again, Paul is trying to be as inclusive. So we're seeing already that there is a effort to be inclusive. But I see a lot of folks trying to be exclusive. So again, that's why I say there's a difference between American Christianity and authentic Christianity. We see what our Christianity is saying. You be inclusive. We also see what American Christianity is saying. You be exclusive. So we got to decide which one are we going to be. What's the message of these first 15 verses? 
We're not going to keep you all day. Uh, we'll share, see if you all have questions, and then we, we'll go from there. Paul is tolerant of different persons and respects their achievements and their viewpoints. He's tolerant. The problem occurs, then others are shut out and made to feel as though they have no accomplishments and contributions like critical race theory. Now, let me share this with you all. Critical race theory is only taught in law school. So all this flipping and flapping, as you all seen when they were doing the confirmation hearings on um, the Judge Brown, all this, you know, showboating and all this other stuff, the guy with the little book and all that kind of stuff, and blessed be the heaven, he didn't mean it that way, but that book became a number one seller already. But see, the problem is some folks have a problem with the truth. Again, if you are a Christian, you bask in the truth. You bathe in the truth. You promote the truth. Why? Because we understand the Bible says the truth sets you free. And if the truth sets you free, that means a lie locks you up. And so if I have the truth, and I want to keep my status, I will promote a lie over the truth because it's a possibility that the truth will make me have to share room at the table. So when you see people call themselves Christians and they are fighting to keep people away, that's not God. That's not how God operates. Again, we're looking at Romans, but it's applicable for right now. It wasn't written to us, but it's written for us. It's applicable. So these are some of the issues that we currently have. And this is why there are certain truths that people don't want out there. You know, they talk about, well, we don't want our kids to be feeling bad. They ought to feel bad. My kids feel bad to learn that their four parents were slaves. So I don't have no problem with their, with their classmates whose grandparents or great foreparents may have been slave. But I had a problem with them feeling bad. I ain't got a problem with it at all. My prayer is that they'll feel bad enough that they will become freedom fighters to make certain this type of mindset doesn't happen again. See, that's the problem. When you have repented, you turn from and turn to. We need this country to repent and turn to equality and equity. They don't want to do that because that's going to cut in on the status quo. So that's why they don't, they don't want the truth out. They don't want their children to understand and look at them funny like, wait a minute. I thought, you know, everybody put itself out of the bootstrap for them to learn that didn't nobody have no doggone boots. That everybody made it off of somebody else. Then they learn that, you know, Africans and the black folks are not just stupid and all and lazy and all that. They're the ones built this doggone country. They learn the truth, which is going to give them a different perspective. But that's what happens when you become a child of God. You learn the truth and you begin to see everyone as your brother and sister in Christ. You cut down the walls of division. You cut down the walls of exclusivism. And you begin to reach out to everyone because you understand that everyone is worthy of God's love. Why? Because you're worthy of God's love. And if you're worthy of God's love, everyone is worthy of God's love. The essence of the gospel relates to the grace of God shown in Jesus Christ. By grace. Didn't earn it. Don't deserve it, but grace. Songwriter said, amazing. When God's love is eternalized, that means it moves beyond lip service. When God's love is more important than nationalism, when God's love is more important than raising up our country over Christ, then we are capable of accepting each other, even though we are different 
and respecting each other fully. Whomever God created deserves respect. Why? Because they are a creation of God. They were made in the image of God. Everyone that was made was made in the image of God. And everyone that has been created by God, there's a certain level of respect and acceptance that they ought to have, flat out. The opening verses of Romans call us to reflect on the relationship between diversity and inclusive. Diverse, but included. That's how God works. That's why the rainbow has multi-colors. It's beautiful when it's all together. It only becomes a rainbow when you have the various colors combined together. That's the beauty of diversity of colors included in the bow. I can't make it any simpler than that. Paul mentions in verse 13 that he has been prevented from making the trip to Rome on several cases in the past. Paul makes a case for an inclusive gospel and seeks to include all those in Rome and believes that his gospel is relevant for all the nations. He explicitly includes people of different educational and language backgrounds, which could be widened in 2022 to ethnicities and colors. Paul's conviction is that the grace of God holds persons in adversity firmly in the hollows of God's hand. And I believe this is perhaps what allowed our foreparents to hang in there doing slavery, doing the civil rights movement when they were saying, I ain't gonna let nothing turn me around because they were convicted that the God, the grace of God would hold them firmly in the midst of their adversity. The gospel of Christ sets no boundaries. There are no boundaries in the, in the gospel of Christ. God said that, that's why Paul later mentions in this chapter that nothing can separate us from the love of God. God's love is boundless. It is limitless. So there are no boundaries where the love of God cannot seep into. There are no cracks. There are no crevices. There are no holes that the love of God cannot seep into and infiltrate. So this is what Paul is trying to say. Oh, yes, you're right. Uh, many pastors, many preachers have lost their way to it come to a conclusion because they want to make it territorial. See, when you're not willing to scoot over, you make what you have territorial. God wants us to be inclusive. But some people feel that by giving room to someone else is going to take away from who they are. Their ego is that small. Their personhood is that small. But God can bless you by realizing that you need other people. None of us are self-made. That's a lie. No one is self-made. Trust me. No one is self-made. I don't care who you are. No one is self-made. Everybody, most people who have great wealth, they took advantage of somebody along the way. And we know how wealth was distributed in this nation. Anytime you preclude or exclude a people from benefiting, you already set them up at a great disadvantage. The biggest industrial revolution, the biggest exchange of wealth in this nation was shortly after the GI Bill came out and everybody started becoming homeowners. There was one group of people that was kept out of the homeowners loop. 
And so they came up with what they call now homeowners associations. And the sole purpose of homeowners association was to exclude, to make certain that no one would sell their homes to African-Americans. So while the rest of this nation was benefiting off of the equity in their homes, we were not even allowed to buy a home. And if we bought homes, they were in the most deplorable areas. And the minute there was a few of us living there, the property value automatically went down. So you can't tell me that God has nothing to say about that kind of shenanigans, about that kind of foolishness. Until you repent, you can't go forward. So all this spiritual nonsense this nation's talking about, the proof is in the pudding. Talk is cheap. It's no mystery how this thing works. You repent for your past sins and you move forward. You repent, which means turn from and turn to. Turn from excluding and turn to including. Turn from racism and turn to equity and equality for everyone it's not science it's not rocket science but so many people are concerned about losing their position losing their spot so yes a lot of preachers they're not going to talk about it. i mean how many preachers have you heard talk about racism being a sin outside of the black community have you ever heard joel osteen say it Hell no. i answer that for you. Nope. Some of these other folks, they're not, going, they're not going to mention it because it benefits them. So they're not going to talk about it. But racism is a sin. We had Mara on here. He went too quick to say it was a sin. He tried to flush it out and, you know, our greatest time, our greatest... Uh, you know, when I asked him the question, when does America ever accomplish this, you know, this love and stuff you're talking about? Because from the beginning, it was set up wrong. Off of the backs of stealing and robbing and killing and raping and kidnapping from the beginning. So when did we ever achieve this spiritual glow? He couldn't answer that. You all were there. Couldn't answer. Because again, it is hard for those who have been on the side of privilege to speak truth and realize, you know what? Maybe what I thought I was a part of is not who I was a part of. And I'm sympathetic to that. You know, I, I was able to read the wonderful book. I encourage you all to read uh, Good White Races by um, uh, Carrie Connolly, excellent book. And she's a, a European American woman who talks about her experience when she had to dis she, she had to recognize that a lot of stuff she was taught about her race and her ethnicity were lies. And it's hard for people to grapple when you've been made to believe that you're the greatest thing since sliced bread to discover you just like everybody else. And a matter of fact, part of the reason why you are the position you are in is because of stuff that other folks did that you took credit for. That's a hard pill to swallow. And I'm sensitive to that. But again, the truth sets you free. <laughs> and a lie locks you up. The truth is not always pretty. Don't always taste good, but I promise it's good for you. It's like, it's like a bottle of Father John's. Father John's never tastes good. But I declare it took care of, the, of that cold, that cough. I don't even know if they make Father John's some more, but I grew up with Father John's. At my grandmother's house, in my mother's house, there was always Father John's. And sometimes the truth can be a dosage of Father John's. It may not taste good going down, but once it lands, it's going to do some internal work that's going to make you feel better. And so that's, that's my challenge. Again, I'm not saying that there are no pastors that are calling out racism outside of our community because there are i happen to know quite a few wonderful pastors who call it like it is and i, I have a very good friend 
who uh, shared with me that she had to leave her church because of the attitude of support they gave to 45 as she did not see Christianity in Christ in their attitude, so she had to leave. She had to leave. And I commend her because in that regard, she's lost some relationships. She's lost some relationships in her own family. But you remember when Jesus said, whoever don't hate their brother, their sister, their mother, and except that, you know, that, that, that's a hard saying. But what he was basically saying is that if you're going to follow me and your loved ones are not following me, you may have to leave them behind. You don't stop loving them. You don't stop reaching out to them. But you cannot follow wrong for wrong's sake. And that's why I tell people all the time, discipleship is a whole nother ship. You can't mix kinship with discipleship. <laughs> you can't mix friendship with discipleship. Discipleship is a standalone. You pray that your kin folks will follow you as you follow Christ. You pray that your friends will follow you as you follow Christ. But if they're not willing to follow you, pray for them and keep it moving. Are there any questions, any comments on the first 15 verses of this first chapter of Romans? Pastor, this isn't exactly a question on that, but until Michelle Obama got in the White House, it was never stressed to my knowledge that this was the people's house and that this was the house that slaves built. It was always for somebody else. It wasn't for us. Yes. Until Michelle Obama got in there. And she made that, she made that statement that made some folks upset. Why? The truth sets you free. Mm -hmm. There are folks who don't want the truth to get out <laughs> because the truth is empowering. When you got people in, when you got people captured and locked up with lies. The last thing you want for them to experience is the truth. This is why we try to get people to understand why elections are so important. If the elections wasn't important, you wouldn't have over 40 states signing voter suppression laws. Why? Because when we vote, we change the trajectory of the election. See, all these elections, they was counting us not voting. But then when we hit the polls, now they mad because we did vote. They got mad when Obama got in the first time. That's when these law stars sit, start coming along and went to the Supreme Court. And they gutted the Voting Rights Act. Trying to make certain that that don't happen again. But one thing about it, whatever God has planned, it's going to come to fruition. Man can't handle God. They can try all they want to. And I got a feeling that some of these folks is plotting and planning. They won't even see 22, 24. They won't be around. I ain't saying I'm proper sign, but I definitely ain't proper lying. Some of them folks will not be around. God will not be defeated. You can't stop the work of God. So you're, you're totally right. And people was upset, but they could not deny the fact. Ben Benjamin Banneker was the designer of Washington, D.C., a brother. But again, once the truth comes out, then our children will feel good about their past. They'll feel good about their ancestors and foreparents who endured all of this and still reached excellence. And then it'll make other folks' children feel a little bad. Like, you know, we ain't, we ain't as superior as we thought we was. But that's what needs to happen. Again, inclusiveness. Include everybody. Everybody brings something to the table. God don't make junk. Every person that God has made, there's the propensity for them to bring something to the table. 
and we miss out because we exclude folks instead of trying to find ways to include folks. Paul has done a wonderful job of laying it open from the very beginning. Any other questions? Are there any questions on Facebook, Sister Johnson? No, we don't have any uh, questions, but we have a whole lot of hearts. <laughs> yeah, man, it, it, it's good because I know sometimes when I get to teach it, sometimes we get some frowny faces <laughs> and some other stuff as well. But, you know, I ain't got a problem with it because if, if they're a pastor not teaching them, don't fool around on this channel because Pastor D is going to teach you. You may not like it, but again, the truth sets you free because a lot unlocked you up. So I'm, I'm, I'm here for freedom because when we begin to understand the truth and we begin to exercise in truth and love of God, we see each other as brothers and sisters in Christ, regardless of our ethnic background, regardless of our color, regardless of any isms that we have in place in this nation, in this world right now. As children of God, there should be a breach. There should be a bridge that flows, a heart that runs from heart to heart, a sense of love that runs from heart to heart. Freshman. That should be something that is innate, innately Christian. And like I said, I'm encouraged because there are a lot of those other folks out there faking it, but they've got a lot of other folks who are living it and are promoting it and are pushing it without question. All right, my brothers and sisters, I'm not going, oh, we right at that, we right at that time. I uh, want to remind everyone um, on Facebook family, God bless you all, glad to have you back. Uh, we are back, there's Sunday school on Saturday um, and we are the hybrid approach every other week. The first and third Sundays, we are in the building for worship. The second and third Sundays, we are remote until July. We will assess we, to June. We will assess, reevaluate, and see where we go from there. We are slowly moving back in because we, de we do hear the rumors of other um, uh, sub, uh, uh, what do you call those things? Uh, not irritants, but uh, variants. Sub variants. Variants. Yeah, sub variances. <laughs> That's floating around and coming along. And again, we're now in the season of spring breaks where people are, you know, taking it off this week, that week, that week, that week. So we will continue to just be wise, to be smart. Um, it is not our intent to ever have to close again. Um, it is our intent to keep it moving. So that's why we're just taking it slow, moving back in slowly. Um, again, we ask everyone. Uh, if you want to come to the service, definitely we ask you to pre-register. The pre-register is just so that we will have an account for who's available, who's at our worship service, so that if we ever have to give notification that one may have been exposed to one who has the virus, we're able to contact those individuals. Um, and, you know, uh, there's no limit on who can show up, who can come. There's even... Uh, registration at the door, but we just need to make certain that everyone is registered. Masks are required. Uh, you know, we, we're we playing it safe. We're playing it smart. Uh, so I uh, just want to um, say that into our Facebook family. Uh, may God bless you. May God keep you. We want to keep, uh, yes, the, 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 the additional boosters are being offered at our church on Thursdays, new time from one to four. We were originally noon to four, but now we're one to four. And then on the second and fourth Saturdays, we're now noon to three, where we were 11 to three for the children. For those five to 11 that would like to um, receive the vaccinations at our church, it is now from noon to three o'clock on the second and fourth Saturdays, we will reevaluate. Um, at the end of this month and see what we will do for next month as it relates to that. Um, okay. Yes, and we need to re-register each time. So if you come the first Sunday, that don't mean that you're good for the whole month. You know, uh, we, we need to know who's in that particular service because as we discovered last week, we had quite a few people who registered who didn't show up. So it's important for us to know 
for the purpose of, of being able to keep in contact with everyone in case there is a situation. Uh, and to our YouTube viewers, uh, you probably see, you, you can probably see the replay uh, of the services. They are alive, but then they also um, are in the um, replay cycle. So we just ask you to be mindful and prayerful of that. Um, we wanna keep various families in our prayers, the Stardew family, Again, the, the, the home going celebration of my beloved uh, cousin Renee will be this Saturday. Um, next Tuesday will be the home going celebration of our beloved brother uh, William Price uh, next Tuesday. So we want to keep those families um, in our prayers uh, and, and, and everyone else that is dealing with uh, the loss of loved ones and going through the process of grieving in the process of grief. Uh, we, we're, we're just praying that God's hand of mercy and love will be with us. Don't forget this Sunday in our noon Zoom, Miss Victoria Edwards um, from the County of Wayne will be coming to share with us, uh, those of us that are entrepreneurs, those of us who are looking to get into business, those of us who have small businesses and looking to expand your business, please be there at our 12 noon uh zoom this sunday uh she's coming to uh give us to spend at least a, probably a good half an hour with us and then we can always reschedule um more uh events and, and more workshops later but i wanted her to come to whet our appetites to uh make us aware again to some of the truths about bids and things of the nature that is always kept from us <laughs> always kept from us and then when we find out about it, it's usually at the end well, they are very intent on making certain that we are learning about it sooner than later. Praise God for our county executive, Warren Evans, who encountered a county that was on the verge of bankruptcy seven years ago. They have had a balanced budget for seven years straight. They're, the county is healthy. The county is, I think, the 45th largest county in the United States. The county of Wayne is larger than several states. And there's a brother at the helm giving leadership to it, which dispels the myth that we can't lead without cheating and all this other stuff and messing stuff up, running stuff into the ground. Those myths are dispelled. And he was honored on this past Monday. I was blessed to be a part of the celebrations of having this Old Smith Terminal named in his honor, the Warren Cleve Evans Terminal now. Um, it was a wonderful event. And the blessing is, they didn't do it after he died. He was able to smell, as he said, his flowers and to see his flowers and to smell his coffee while it's going on now. So we are grateful to God for that. I don't know if there's any other announcements that we need to make. Uh, Pastor, um, when you go out to the airport and see his name on that sign, telling you to go to that North Terminal. Yes. And then his name across there, it really makes you feel good. Yes. And, and again, he is one who has delivered on everything he said he was trying to do during the pandemic when it first hit. He reached out and that's how we were able to give food, uh, distributed things of that nature. He turned inward to make certain that our communities were taken care of because in Wayne County, there are 43 cities in Wayne County. And so he took care of everyone in the county of Wayne. Um, we also want to remind people of to, to, we have two petitions that we're asking people to sign. One is for the uh, to have Pastor Cobb uh, put on the, the, the ballot uh, to potentially be appointed judge of the Third uh, Circuit Court. And the other petition is the Good Time Bill, the Good Time Initiative, so that inmates can receive training and good time off, have their sentence cut down for good behavior. These are incentives inside of the prison system that Michigan is only one of six states that don't offer that. Even states like Louisiana, uh, Texas, and Florida offer these incentives. So we are behind time. So um, again, uh, we're, we're looking forward and we need people to sign these petitions so that we can get these measures on the ballot. All right. Is there anyone that requires special prayer? Or do we have any praise requests, praise reports, or prayer requests? Maybe prayer. Prayer, prayer requests. Okay. 
prayer request for Sister Hawker Day's husband. Uh, okay. He's at home, uh, but she said he's not doing well. Okay, we we'll keep him in our prayers. Yes, definitely. Uh, you pray uh, for my brother-in-law. He's back in the hospital. Okay. And pray for me. Okay. Please continue to pray for my nephew, James Harvey the Third. Okay. All right, Sister Devonna, do we have any prayer requests on Facebook? Um, Sister Brenda is uh, displaying praying hands, so oh, okay. I'm believing she's just asking for prayer for his Okay. Son. All right. All right. We want to continue to pray for Brother uh, Deacon Mylon Jack um, Johnson. Um, last uh, Saturday, um, he uh, they had the homegoing service for his mom, who made her transition a few weeks ago. So we want to keep the Johnson family in our prayers as well. All right, let us pray. Gracious God, we are thankful. We are grateful for yet another day. We thank you, Lord, for uh, the mess, the lesson, and the message in the first fifteen verses of the first chapter of Romans. Lord, we understand the importance of being inclusive, of including everyone and making room for everyone at the table that you have created. Lord, help us to grow in unity. Help us to understand what that means and let us practice what it means, oh Lord, in your name. We ask you to bless the churches that are engaged in being inclusive and trying to invite every and welcome everyone Lord, we ask you to challenge those churches that are not. Lord, we just pray for your guidance. All of those names that have been mentioned, all of the situations and scenarios that have been lifted, Lord, we put them in your hands right now. We ask you to handle them, Lord. We ask you to deal with them, O oh Lord, in the name of Jesus. Lord, we ask you to bless us this night. Bless the vaccinations that will take place at the church on tomorrow, the testing, O oh Lord, and all that we are doing and attempt to do for the community, Lord. Continue to bless our church. Continue to bless our efforts, O oh Lord, in the name of Jesus. We ask you to bless this night for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 All right, to our Facebook family, we say good night and may God bless you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.